So I want to introduce Peter. And uh, I'm fortunate Peter's my sensei, so I get to work with him a lot, which is wonderful. He's filled with information. <laughs> he has actively studied bonsai and, and practiced the art of bonsai for over 20 years. He apprenticed with Mr. Janjirko Tanaka at Ashian Bonsai Garden. He was released from the five-year apprenticeship program after only two years with Mr. Tanaka's blessing and returned to the U.S. to continue his own business. Peter T. Bonsai in Northern California. Peter is well-respected throughout the U.S. as an instructor and artist. We are definitely in for a treat. Peter will be teaching us about structure and pad development and junipers. Please welcome Peter. Go ahead, right. Peter. Hi, everybody. Okay, just to double check. Can you yep. hear me? Does that sound okay? Sounds okay, good. Okay, great. All right, so it looks like we got a, a good amount of participants. That's great. Uh -huh. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for for uh, for coming for this uh, for this presentation. So uh, I'll get right to it. There's a couple of pictures I'm going to show you, and then there's a couple of trees that I'm going to show you. We'll do a little bit of whiteboard stuff so I can draw the, uh, draw things out, talk about some structural things I look for in juniper pads. And then we'll get to the uh, to a couple of different trees we can look at and I'll show you kind of my thought process in kind of real world branch selection and, and I'll move stuff around such as uh, like on this tree here, here's another example of another tree uh, and so forth, something a little bit more raw like this. So we'll go through things. I may jump around a little bit if you have any questions, just feel free to to type in in the uh, in the chat, and we'll try to answer them as we go. Uh, I'll also, after say the talk, I'll I'll see if anybody has any questions. We can answer a lot of them at that time too. So I'm gonna pick up the camera. Okay. So I laid out some of these trees right here just to give you an idea of some trees that are a little bit more on the on the finished side. And I'll get a little uh, closer to these trees so you can kind of check them out. I'm going to focus mainly on the pad development, talking about how I lay out pads, uh, as opposed to you know other topics such as where do you want the pad and so forth. Uh, I might talk about that a little bit, but I'll, I'll try to keep the the presentation a little bit more tight. You just focus on kind of one subject, or only a couple of subjects related to that. So if you look at this tree, for example, I'll just get in close. And I'll get under it. You can see there's a, a number of a, a number of pads. So you at the top, you know, a couple little shells. It's good to kind of see it when it's a little bit more finished. So you get an idea of what might be your end goal for some of the structure on your tree. Now this tree was worked on and cut back about a month ago or so. So it's actually a little thinner than normal. And that's why we can kind of see through it a bit. And as I get closer, you can kind of see the branches on the inside. I'll get to the underside here. Let me keep going. Peter, if I can this suggest, presentation. move the sure. camera yes. over. So it oh, okay, am I going too focus. fast? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm just looking at what it looks like for me. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. No okay, problem. so I'll hold it there. Okay, and I'll move it. So interestingly enough, this trunk is a California juniper, and it was grafted with Kishu uh, juniper about 15 years ago or so. And this whole tree was actually built from two approach grafts. So every single one of these branches was developed from just a little whip that was attached to the trunk. I'll get a little closer there. That's one of the connections right there. And you see it's all melded and it's pretty thick. So the nice thing about grafting trees is that you have the ability to essentially grow the branches wherever you want and develop any shape that you want. We can move on to the next one. Here's a little smaller tree. I see one of the questions. Uh, one of the questions is how was the graft attached? That's a that's a whole process of growing a juniper whip. 
growing it long enough and then uh, cutting a, essentially a slit on the lifeline and then approach grafting or uh, laying down that whip into that uh, channel that you cut. There's a couple of little extra cuts you have to make, but generally you're putting a whip into a channel and you're nailing it in and you want it to fuse. And after about a year, year and a half, it fuses. You can take all the hardware off and then you can cut the rootstock off of your graft and then let the foliage grow. And at some point, the California juniper foliage got cut off and we let the tissue foliage run. I'll show you another example of that in, a, in another table. So this is a Rocky Mountain juniper and the same thing was done years ago, except it was grafted with Toyogawa. That focuses a little bit. So you can see a Toyogawa foliage. versus tissue foliage, a little different. This foliage is a little thinner and it's a little lighter green. This one's almost finished in development. It hasn't been worked on yet, so it's kind of bushy. And you can see some of the branches on the bottom. So remember this tree because I'm going to show you some photos of it when it was earlier in development. And same with this one that's coming up next. So this one has Kishu grafted onto it also. The foliage hasn't been worked on, so it's a little messy, but you kind of you kind of see the individual pads a little bit. Okay. I see one of the questions came in. How do you decide which foliage to go with? It really becomes, it's really a, a preference thing. So, you know, you, you kind of weigh the pros and cons of this particular type of foliage. It's a little darker green, a little denser, it's a little heavier looking. So sometimes if it's a tree that has a lot of movement or a tree that is uh, very static or very heavy, like this trunk, even though there's a gap right there, it has a little bit of a heavier trunk. It just kind of goes upright. So it kind of works with this kind of foliage. When you get to something that's a little bit more elegant and soft, you might prefer the Toyogawa foliage because it's generally a little thinner and lighter feeling. So it kind of goes with the trunk a little bit more, it goes better with the movement. Of course, there's other types of juniper foliage you can graft on too. In Japan, Itoyagawa is kind of the preferred foliage right now because of the light feeling it has. The only downside with Itoyagawa is if you live in very hot environments, it's a little harder to grow them. Kishu is a bit more forgiving. You can cut it a little bit harder without it going juvenile. The only issue is that you tend to get spider mites on these guys first. So you just got to watch out for that. Okay. So Dodie, if you can uh, run the slideshow, I can talk about uh, some of the development that uh, these trees went through. Okay, here we go. So we'll go through this real quick. Oh, okay, somebody asked, how do you address spider mites? So the, the most important thing about spider mites, and then we'll, we'll talk about this photo here, is that you have to recognize when your tree has them. So what happens is that it will feed on the tree and it will actually start turning the foliage kind of a, a grayish color. Sometimes if you have a lot of it, if you touch the foliage, your fingers are a little bit sticky. You can also pat the foliage. So something, something that you can do, is that if you think you have spider mites, you can get a sheet of paper, and a lot of people say this, and then you can pat the foliage. And on the sheet of paper, you can see little tiny, they're no bigger than like a period. Uh, if, you, if you rub them, you'll see kind of little streaks on there and you'll know that you have active spider mites. But you don't know that you have them until you actually see the discoloration on foliage. And the, and the main goal is to recognize that early. So this tree right now is green. And you have to expect, okay, this is what I expect to see when I walk through my garden. And if there's just a little patch that's lighter color or dull color, 
then you got to hone in on that and check it out. If you can get it early just by seeing that little spot, it won't spread. You don't want to wait until this whole top is gray before you're like, oh, I think I have a problem. Okay. So once you recognize it, you can use a product. I brought this product out because I had a feeling someone's going to ask about this. So can you see what there? So the product is called Floramite. That's what I use. You can get it on Amazon. It's a, an eight ounce bottle. It's a little pricey, but you only have to use like half a teaspoon per gallon. And it works really well for me. It kills all stages of spider mites. So you don't have to worry about eggs and things like that. You just gotta be careful not to overuse it because spider mites can become resistant to it. So just use it sparingly when you only need to. And I only spray it on trees that get spider mites like this juniper here, uh, black pines can get them. Um, uh, sometimes cedars uh, or cypress can get them, I mean. So you just gotta kind of watch out for them. I don't usually have to spray this on maples, for example. Okay. So there's the there's the product. Peter, there's other spider mites. Yeah. Uh -huh. Spray all the trees that tend to get spider mites or only the ones you identify that have spider mites? Usually when I identify a few trees that have spider mites, I'll spray all the trees that are that could potentially be affected. Uh, if you don't do that, you'll end up hopping around a little bit. You'll see spider mites on this tree and then spider mites on that tree. Now, the downside to this product is that you can't spray the tree and think it's going to protect your tree. You can only spray it when you see spider mites, and that's when it works. You can't spray it and then it somehow uh, prevents spider mites from showing up. So that's one of the downsides is that you do have to have them first and then spray it. But generally, I'll spray it on the trees that I know can get them but I'll wait until I see some, some activity happening first before I spray it. Well, right now is kind of the time when it can start, but it, spider mites can affect any of us any time of year, really. It used to be kind of a summer thing, but I've seen them in the middle of winter. So you just gotta keep an eye out. Okay, let's go to the slideshow. So this was the, this tree, it's a photo of the tree in 20, 2014 or so, something like that. It's of the last tree that we see uh, that, that was showing you. And you can see it's a little less developed. The, can the top canopy is smaller. The bottom branches were being grown out. Uh, pads are just starting to be built. And you can see throughout the years, as we continue building and building, you can get kind of the finished product. OK, let's go to the next photo. Here's that uh, kind of a tall goose. Okay, so this particular tree is the uh, the middle tree that I was showing you uh, with the long skinny trunk. And this is early on when the tree was grafted, you can see there's a lot of uh, branches that got ginned and then the gins got wired. Those used to be alive. So we actually grew some branches to create gin. We minimized it down to a few branches that we just started growing out and started developing the pad structure from there. That piece of rebar is to hold the tree up because uh, the root system was kind of weak and it was in that big pot. But now that the root system is solid, it's in a much smaller pond. Okay, next photo. So here's an example of a Hanoki cypress with a lot of ramification. This is a bottom up view. Uh, it just shows you that when you're developing the tree and if you, if you take the time to develop the branches slowly and focus on developing more and more branches, you can get structures that look like that and you can have a very full canopy. So when you, why do we have branches like that? Why do we try to get so much division uh, on our bonsai? It's generally, I mean, if you're, if you're looking at your tree and you, you want it to look more tree-like, trees have branches. And generally, the older the tree, the more branches they have that build the canopy. So you don't want to look under your tree and see only a few branches. That's, that's what young trees have. But if you see uh, a tree that has a lot of branches flowing from the center out, and multiple divisions, it makes a tree look very old, which uh, which helps what we're trying to do because most of the time we're trying to create bones like that looks old. All right, next. Okay, here's an example of a Western juniper that I had in the uh, Pacific Bonsai Expo. That's when the foliage was pretty much raw. Everything's just kind of everywhere. Uh, next slide. So this was the first initial styling. And you can see everything's kind of floppy a little bit. You get some shape in there, but overall you'll notice uh, a few things. 
you'll see that the branch structure is very close into the trunk. It's not fully extended out. It's not the size that I want the tree yet. And that's something very important to understand is that when you're styling a tree such as a juniper and you're thinking about what you're trying to create, your first initial styling, the styling should always, or the branch structure should always be smaller than what you really want. Because after one styling, it's very unlikely that you actually have the branches to develop your final tree. If the tree, after, you, uh, after the initial styling, if the tree is the size that you want, it's only gonna look too leggy when you're actually finished with it. So when you're looking at the photo, Branches on the top, on the apex, they got cut short. The lower branch on the right, they got kind of padded out, but it's relatively short. We're still trying to build the vision. If you look all the way to the left, the left lowest pad, that was actually a branch that I did nothing to other than I cleaned it up just a little bit and I let it extend because I needed to build a pad further away from the tree. So I didn't even try to make a pad. I just laid out a bushy branch and let it grow that direction. I didn't even bother working on that top, top right pad yet because I was trying to grow some stuff out. And then later I ended up wiring. Uh, so as we look at, uh, I think the next picture is the final picture. If we go to the next photo. No, not quite. Oh, not quite, okay. So this is a couple of years later. So the first, uh, first styling was in 2014. So this photo is 2016. And so you can see things got a little wider, right? I started with a little smaller canopy. I started cutting the tree back yearly, getting branches to divide, building the ramification. And after a couple of years, the tree got a little wider. You can see a little bit of definition in the pads, but it's not really solid yet, but you kind of get a, a basic glimpse of it. Okay, so this kind of work takes, takes time. It's not an instant thing. Your, your tree is not supposed to look like this after your first styling. Uh, if it is, you probably use some, a lot of times uh, improper branch usage is what happens when you get kind of more of that instant bonsai kind of look. Okay, next photo. Okay, so this is the tree uh, repotted into a smaller pot uh, and a little bit more on the finished side because I showed it at the Pacific Bonsai Expo uh, last November. Okay, so now the tree is much fuller. If you look at the foliage on the left side, you see where the green is in line with where the dead wood is. Remember in the earlier photo, the green was way inside of that dead wood that was sticking out. So you can see how much uh, space, it, how, how wide it's gotten uh, as, as I develop the branches, it's slowly growing the tree out to a fuller size. Now I think on this tree, I can probably get it a little wider, but then at some point it's gonna look too wide and I might have to shrink it back. And so this is a picture in 2022. Generally, the tree looked like this in 2020, more or less. Uh, I see one of the questions is that I changed the angle. I probably changed the angle. It looks like I tilted the tree up to the left a little bit to get it more taller. Uh, the original photo is probably sitting a little bit lower. I changed the front slightly also. So th this tree is actually sitting in my yard outside. I, I didn't bring it in because it's just kind of big. <laughs> okay, so that's the same thing. That's the recap. There's that tree, and you saw a photo when it was uh, when it was much uh, emptier. Same wow. with that guy. So just with a little time and you know good solid work, you can all develop kind of piece like this. And so one of the things I'm going to talk about is how do I develop you know, individual pads? And you can see the pad shapes. There's a lot of different sizes. Generally, there's a certain shape that I like, but you're really free to create any kind of shape you, you want. So I'm gonna bring out the whiteboard and I'll draw some stuff out that gave you guys a better understanding of how I lay things down. Okay, so generally speaking, before we talk about the structure of the pad, let's just look at the end on what a final shape might look like. Okay, so when you have a pad, say here is your tree, and let's just say here's one branch that's coming down and you're looking at the side view of a pad. Let's just say you have a number of branches that build a pad and I'm just gonna draw a shape. 
So you can have your pad be very thick like that, but you see there's a point right here and it starts going back. So let's just say these are the individual points of foliage. Okay. So that's kind of a side view. Sometimes people like to make pads that are more shallow. Sometimes people like pads that are even rounder. So these are just different preferences in styling. So this is fairly somewhat neutral. This looks a little sharper, more aggressive, and this looks very soft and happy. Now, depending on what this trunk looks like, you can go with any number of these shapes. And sometimes you can kind of blend. Usually I might make one kind of low like this, and then I'll have some that's a little rounder on the same tree. It still has generally a soft feel and a soft feel. Usually I try not to get this mixed in with these guys because it's a little stiff for these branches. Some of you might have seen people style trees where it's very stiff and very low. Sometimes needle junipers are styled this way because needle junipers are very sharp and their dead wood is very strong and spiky. So they kind of like going with this. So to say that's a side profile. Here's a bird's eye view. Here's the top view. And when people say fan shape on a pad, it really is kind of like a fan. And in this case, the fan shape is uh, this certain shape right here. You can create a fan shape that is a little bit more pointy. Okay. That's really your call. Usually pointy is a little bit either more aggressive or sometimes pointy is makes it look a little young. It's kind of like here's your tree and say your top is pointy versus dome. Usually dome makes the tree look a, little, look a little older. So I tend to make the paths look more broader. But depending on the styling you're going for, you can you have a full range. You have from this to this. Oops. You can make it almost very flat. Usually we don't make them super flat like a block. Let me try that. Usually we don't do that. Okay. The reason why we don't do that is because trees naturally just don't grow in this shape. They tend to do this because it's always trying to grow bigger and it's spreading out. That's why we tend to see this fan shape on more developed trees. Let's look at what it looks like if you're looking at a pad straight on. A lot of times it will look like this. So you're looking at a pad straight on. Some things you'll see. Middle, middle. There's generally a middle that kind of starts things off and then there'll be other branches. And what you're gonna see here is a slight curve up. That's curved. Now some people like to make it very straight. Some people curve it even more. Uh, let me redraw that. I say they exaggerate a little bit more. Okay. If you exaggerate kind of like the smiling face in the bottom, the pad looks softer. If it's very straight, then it looks much stiffer. So again, it's just a styling preference. I always go with just a slight movement up. Okay. Some other thing to note. Here's the top of the pad, and you see how it curves down. Again, if we keep the bottom the same and say I decide to do a shape that's lower, you still have that middle, that middle, but it's just this angle is different. And that makes the pad look different than that one. Again, it's a little lower, it's a little sharper feeling, a little more aggressive looking, a little bit more stiff whereas this is real soft. So you gotta think about what kind of tree you have and what kind of style you're going for, and you can kind of pick and choose what kind of pad shapes you're looking for. So that's kind of the end goal when all the branches are set and then you have this shape. Okay. But let's look at the structure of the tree. So to start off, some basic key things to know before you start laying out pads. 
is that you got to look at your tree and decide, is it ready to be built? Do you have branches to build paths? So for example, if you have a trunk and you have a branch and you have branches coming off of that out there and you want your pad to be here, but there's no foliage here yet, no branches. It's just a long branch and it could be varying sizes. Let's say it's that thick. If you're trying to build a pad here and you don't have any branches, what branch do you have? You really only have this one branch, the main branch. And there are no branches to build this pad because all of them are out here. So if you're in a situation where you're looking at your tree and you see this, essentially you have a leggy branch, there's no pad building yet. You're not even at that stage. You have to figure out how do you get branches in here? So you can then build off of that to get this pad shape. So what would you need to do if this is the, your situation? Let's just stick with junipers. You may have to cut it back and see if you can get something to butt off the tree. And hopefully it will butt in close enough to where you can use that material to develop your pad. But it does require you to recognize that you want a pad right here and not here. So for example, here's a really good example of that. So we got this kind of wild trunk and you see how there's buds on the inside. And it's not supposed to be a very big tree. It was grown for a while and it got big, but we're trying to make a little smaller tree. If this is the material you're working on and you want a small tree, you gotta get these small guys to grow really close to the trunk. Now these guys weren't all there when I first got this tree. They were all, the foliage was all out here and there was more. And what I had to do is I had to cut it back to promote this back budding. And I'm about to cut more of it off because these back buds are now big enough. And now I can grow those out and build the pads. So taking this tree and saying, I wanna develop something, it just requires you to cut it back for now to get the branches that you actually can use, which are these short ones here. And it just requires you to grow. Well, before you know it, they grow. Something important to note also is when you look at Kishu foliage, like this stuff right here, you see how the foliage is very tight. A lot of division is everywhere. You have to figure out how to grow your tree so that it grows nice and tight like this. Because if it's tight like this, it gives you tons of areas to cut back to. It's not like a leggy branch like this one. See, when it's leggy like that, it doesn't give you a lot of options to cut back. But when it's dense like this, you have a lot of areas to cut back. One of the I saw one of the questions. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, there's, well, the questions are coming in. Um, how do you encourage okay, okay. the back bud? And how much can uh -huh. you cut back and when? Okay, so good questions. So let's start with how do you get it to back bud? Well, first of all, if say you don't have back buds here, you don't know if it can back bud or not because you don't see any, so you have to try. So let's say all the foliage is out here and say this is the foliage that you have and you're trying to get it to back bud somewhere inside. How much can you cut off? Well, if the foliage is growing like this and it's nice and healthy, nice and dark green, on key shoes, I found if the tree is healthy, I've cut it as hard as 90% of the foliage off to where it's just like this one tuft right here left, but it's super healthy. And the tree will start back budding or growing here uh, without any juvenile foliage or any of that uh, bad stuff happening. And the tree doesn't die or anything like that. Um, Peter, if you want to go a little light, yeah. Sorry, like on that yep. particular branch, do you just cut off uh -huh. down to that one last tuft? Or are you talking? You have to. Yeah, if this is the case right here, there's actually this tuft here. 
So this top right here is strong enough that I can cut the rest of this branch off and I won't worry that this branch is gonna die. And that will help trigger a backbone. But you gotta make sure that the foliage is healthy like this. If it's kind of spindly or it's kind of sickly, then we can't cut as much. Let's just say, for example, this guy's not too healthy. Maybe I got to keep this one too, and then I cut here. And then once this gets stronger and this gets stronger, then I can cut here. There is no real specific time that you have to, that you can or cannot cut this branch. It's just a matter of if this is strong enough, that's the time you can cut this. It could be in the middle of summer. It could be in the middle of winter. I think for most of us, our winter, we're not anywhere close to like sub-zero temp degrees. So you don't have to worry about working on them in the uh, winter time. But a lot of times in the summer, that's one time that I go through and I can make these cuts. But really, anytime you see healthy enough foliage, you can go ahead and make that cut. And I usually just look at the rest of the tree and just see, okay, there are multiple cuts, and then I bring it into the workshop, and then I go for it, make these cuts. But I can't stress enough that you got to make sure that the tree is healthy before you make those cuts. So really focus on how do you get your junipers to grow like this? Did I answer all those questions? Yeah, you did, but now you mean, how do you, um, how do you get it to grow like this? Oh, okay. <laughs> Good question. So how do I get it to grow? Let's see here. So there's a couple of things you can do. And we'll go through this, this place a little, uh, little fast. Well, first of all, you want to make sure, okay, you don't get any insects or diseases. So I make sure I spray, watch for insects, spray for fungus. So you know that that's not going to get you. For those that have worked with me, you've seen this a number of times. How do you get a tree to grow healthy? Well, there's a lot of different ways to grow a tree healthy. I think generally, I think most of us can grow a tree healthy. It's just really what rate of growth we're talking about. And that's what I tend to focus on. Okay. So it gets divided up into these categories. Okay, see that okay. Which breaks into cutting back or thinning. There is actually two ways you can cut the tree to get two different reactions from the tree. So this part, number one includes these five guys right here. And part two is step six. So everything one through five, if you change any of that will affect how your entire tree grows. So how much sunlight you give the tree, what kind of water, how often you water will affect how the tree grows, what kind of soil medium you use, how big the or small the size of the pot. Number four, repotting interval. The year that you repot, the tree grows different than the subsequent years when they're more established. And then number five, how you're feeding the tree. So a combination of these fives can yield a certain rate of growth. So for example, I'll just go through this real quick. Okay, make sure that the tree gets enough sun and it's not getting, say, sunburn, or it actually is getting sun and it's not just in the shade too much. And that's gonna be different for each tree. Generally where I'm at, I get a lot of sun and I have 100 plus degree days. So a lot of my junipers are under 30% shade during the growing season. The water that I use, I try to use water that is not hard. So clean water or water that's not hard that has a lot of calcium in it. And I also make sure my pH is currently at 6.5 as opposed to 
9.2, which is what it is out of the 10. Okay, so that, go, that makes a difference. And of course, how often am I watering? Am I watering the tree on time when the tree needs it? Or am I underwatering it? Which means the tree will slow down. Number three, soil and pot. If you put it in a soil medium that's on the drier side, say you use akadama and you use a 30% a akadama mix and the rest is pumice or lava, which are drier components, the tree will grow faster. There's a lot of oxygen, doesn't hold a ton of water. So you can go with a drier soil mix. If you put the tree in a smaller pot, it kind of is twofold. If you put it in a smaller pot, the temperature of the roots increase faster and the tree will actually grow faster in a smaller pot. But then it also gets root bound faster in a smaller pot. So then it starts slowing down. So somewhere there, there's a happy medium. If you put it in a pot that's too big and the roots are too cold, the tree will slow down. But it, once it gets established, it won't get root bound. It will just get stronger and stronger every year. Repotting. Okay, did you repot it this year or not? If you repot, usually the tree slows down on the repotting year. And then uh, an easy thing to adjust, fertilizer. Are you fertilizing enough or more than enough or under fertilizing? And that will result, that will change how your tree grows. Everybody uses the, do, does these five things a little differently and we, we kind of find the right combination that works for them. And that's what I've been doing. I'm trying to get very consistent with these individual components to, uh, to get a certain result uh, in the growth uh, habits of my tree. So adjusting these guys, that's kind of the first step. For the most part, usually what I tell people is most people probably get enough sun, so that's usually not the case. Most of the time, it's how often they actually water the tree. And are they fertilizing the tree enough? It's usually what I'll, I'll tell people to look at first if they're not growing their juniper as well. Assuming that it's, again, it's not a fungus or insect problem that's, that's just draining the tree. Okay. So these are the easy adjustments. Fertilizing is very easy. You just throw more on there. And then making sure you water on time. Uh, one of the things, since it's, su it's summer right now and it's very hot, something to think about is that if you're watering your tree multiple times a day because the tree needs it, it's very important to focus, figure out when is your first watering and when is that second watering required. I know a lot of us work. So say you water a tree at 7 a.m. before you go to work. And then at the end of the day, you come back home. And let's say you finally get home at 6 because of traffic. If you water at 7, and depending on what soil medium you use, the tree could be too dry by the time you water it, even though you say you water two times a day. This tree may have needed water at 3 o'clock. But you're not home at 3 o'clock. You're home at 6 o'clock. And now the tree is starved for water for about three hours. And that can affect how your tree grows. It doesn't mean the tree is dried up and crispy, but it does weaken the tree. And now it might not be growing as expected or as well as you want to because of this gap. So because of that gap, if you have to work with that, you might have to change what you use for your soil. You might have to use an automated system. Some people put sphagnum moss on top of their soil. Uh, some people use a little bit bigger pot just to help tie them over because their schedule is this way. Just to give you an idea on my schedule, if it's 95 degrees and everything is grown, my first spot watering on some trees is 9 a.m. My normal watering is about 10 to 11 a.m. That's water just about everything. My second spot watering after that is about... 2.30 to 3. That's for the trees that seem to like a lot of water, like a lot of oaks. And then my final watering is about 4.30. So there are some trees that gets watered four times a day. Now, that I know not all of us can do that. That's a little bit crazy. Okay. But it just worked out well for what I have set up in my yard and the type of trees that I have and the kind of growth I'm looking for. 
but you can, if you have to do this again, you can set up a system like an automated system if you're not here to do that, or you just make these adjustments. Soil, pot size. Maybe you have to put it in a little shadier spot so it doesn't dry up so fast, but you know that there are consequences because that means the tree is going to slow down a little bit. Okay. So what combination can you use to get the foliage to grow really tight and really happy? And that requires a lot of experimentation. The good part is that it only really falls into these categories. There's no like mystery one that I'm not telling you. It's just how you work these five and in what combination to get the result that you're looking for. And then the second part is how you cut the tree. If you cut the tree too hard and then you weaken the tree, then it doesn't matter how good you do this, you're cutting the tree too much. If you're not cutting the tree enough, and say you have a branch, let's see if you can see that, there you go. And you have a branch that grows here, and let's say it's dense, and you don't do anything with it, and it grows and gets stronger, and it starts dividing, a lot of this interior foliage, they start to grow leggy and weak because they're so far back in the tree because you allow this to happen. And so by not cutting it on time, you may be growing what used to be dense foliage into leggier foliage. And that's just purely a timing thing. So there is that. But I would say work one through five first before you work on six. I know there was a couple of questions there. I was looking at the whiteboard, so I couldn't see the question. Yeah, one there, of the questions something was, I need to answer? yeah, how long do you water each time? Uh, like each tree? Yes, I guess. Yeah. Okay, okay. So if I'm going through each tree and I'm watering uh, and I'm using my uh, my bonsai watering wand, um, I don't really time it. Maybe, usually here's my, uh, I'll draw a draw picture here. So say here's my bench and here's another bench. And let's say here's one tree, two trees and so forth. I don't necessarily water it until I see water going out the bottom uh, because that just takes a lot of time to see that. But I can see water going through on the top. So say I'm walking here and I water, and let's just say, I would say I water, maybe it's five seconds, if that. I mean, five seconds doesn't sound very long, but when you're watering a tree and you count to five, oh, that's a good amount of water. So I water everything on this side. Say I'm walking right here and I'm watering. I water, water half, water the back half, back half. And then once I come here to this aisle, I'll water what is now the front, but it's the back, the other half, and the other half, and the other half. So with this pattern that I go through, everything gets watered on one side the first pass. And then when I go into the back, everything gets watered a second time on the back half. But of course, there's spillage that goes to the front too. So by doing that, I know that I'm putting enough water on there that the tree is getting fully hydrated and it's not like a light water. Now, sometimes when I do the spot watering, say it's not the, say it's 9 a.m. and I'm spot watering, I'll go and look at the trees and say, oh, this one is dry, I'll water that. This one's not too dry. I know I'm gonna water at 10, 11, so I skip it because you don't wanna over water too much also. And this one looks drier and so forth. After a while, each of us will get used to our garden and we'll start to pick up on the ones that always wants to dry out first. And we know, okay, we got to check those and check those. And we quickly glance at these guys. Oh, they're okay. But we know these guys dry out. Okay. So it's important to know which tree likes a lot of water. So you can either group them together or you know that when you're water, walking through your garden water, you know, you really got to get those. So that's very important and not to overdo it on these. Though I will say, most trees that you're working on, if you overwater them, it's better to overwater than underwater because your tree can get very weak if it's underwater. It can slow down if you overwater it, but not the same as if it gets too dry. I know that sometimes if a tree is being overwatered, I will purposely dry it out and allow it to uh, not say there's root rot or something. So there, there is a time where you do that. 
But if everything is okay and you're worried about, okay, am I watering too much? Well, first of all, if everything's okay, you're probably watering just fine. And if you had to water a little extra because, well, it's not 10 yet, it's only nine, it doesn't need water, but I gotta go. It's okay that you water it a little bit more than normal, especially if it's only for a short period of time and it's not every day for all year. Okay. I have a couple more questions. Uh, okay. Was, do you ever pot deeper, meaning put more space at the top of the pot um, if a tree needs more water? Uh, I hope I captured that correctly. So if say here is your root ball, uh, it, it sounds like would I ever do this? So bury the tree deeper so that it's essentially in a deeper pot. Uh, I don't normally bury it deeper for that reason to help hold more water, but if I did need it to hold more water, I will put it in a deeper pot if I really have to. Now the, the size of the shape of that pot might not be ideal for presentation, but as growing, this might be ideal as opposed to putting it in something super tiny and you might have a hard time watering it, even though it look, might look good. So I will, I will do that. Though in my experience, I have found that when people start putting trees in very shallow pots, if they're not careful, the tree usually starts to decline. And so if you wanna be on the safe side, I always recommend not necessarily wider, just a little deeper, maybe an extra inch, that really helps a lot of people in maintaining the health of their tree. Just because you just hold, you got all this space for roots to grow, more soil, doesn't heat up as fast, doesn't dry out as fast. Okay. Hopefully I answered that question. Michael, let me know if I didn't phrase it correctly for you. Uh, the other question is, there's two questions. Um, okay. How do you treat the P pH? How do you lower the pH? And where do you get okay. a water wand? Oh, okay. My watering wand, I actually, uh, I, I went to Bonsai tonight. I visited uh, Jonas uh, Dupuy from uh, Bonsai tonight, and he sells brass watering wands. And I think he sells steel watering wands too. Uh, I like the Bonsai watering wand because the, the, uh, the stream that comes out of it is very light. It doesn't push. Uh, the foliage around uh, the soil around too much and it's very fine uh, i tried using products like you know those dram uh, wands that have like a thousand heads they still just output a little too much water so I, i'd say the bonsai wands uh, from japan or wherever they're made uh, seems to be very much superior to most other water wands i see too many people wash soil away so here's your pot and here's your tree and you purposely put it in this pot and you purposely put the soil level at that high. And then there's so much water that over time they wash so much soil away that it's this low. And you have essentially just shrunk your pot down when you intended to have it here. Okay, so you don't want that. Okay. The only time you want that is if you actually did that on purpose. But if you didn't, you don't wanna wash all that soil away. So you can go visit Bonsai tonight and they will, and he should have water and wands, uh, different types. Uh, unless you go to Japan, you can buy one there too. <laughs> I don't know if they sell one on Amazon. Uh, I will say this though, just as a tip, here's your water and wand. Okay, and say it, it sprays out. Make sure there's a little rosebud and that's where all the little dots are right here. There's usually a ring that goes around that holds that rosebud in place make sure you buy one where that ring is made of metal okay and same thing right here the connection here you want metal some of them are plastic here and the ring is plastic all it takes is for you to drop that one in the ground one time and it'll crack that plastic and then it'll fall apart same way here so just spend the extra money make sure that's metal and it'll last you a long time and a lot of times you can get replacement uh, rosebuds too, because it's you can dent them very easily when they get kind of beat up, and you can just replace that without replacing the whole thing. Okay. okay. For pH, we'll go through that real quick. 
pH. I use a device called uh, dose, dosetron. It's a it's a siphoning type system. I uh, blend. Uh, I use forty five percent vinegar. Did I spell that right. Forty five percent vinegar. I make a solution. The dosetron pulls that solution and adds it into my uh, garden hose. And so what comes out of my watering wand is water that is 6.5. So depending on where your original uh, pH is, and mine is, let's say nine, I have to make a certain solution to bring it down to here. Now you have to test your pH first and know what you gotta do. I've tested some of my clients in Sacramento and it was, it was nice. Theirs was right at seven, which is great. They don't even have to worry about doing this. But for me, mine is so high that I started doing that. And there's a reason for this pH right here. The lower the pH, generally the absorption rate of the fertilizer that you put on your tree uh, is higher when the pH is lower. If the pH is high, you can put a lot of food on your tree, but the tree doesn't get any of it, doesn't pull any of it up. So even though you think you're fertilizing a lot, a high pH means you're not the tree's not actually getting it, it's just sitting in the soil. And it can build up over time and potentially cause problems. Okay. I have uh, some more, lots more questions. Does okay. root rot <laughs> often require repotting or does it generally recover drying out a little? And how do you recognize it uh, quickly in the foliage? Okay, if you have root rot, I'll, I'll tell you this for junipers, and we'll stick with junipers. For junipers, I water them about twice a day right now. My soil mix for them is about 40% akadama and 60%, let's say, pumice. I've had some that are in more akadama, like 50%, and I have never once had root rotting. Okay. And they're usually wet all the time. Not super damp wet. I don't go out of my way to overwater, but they're definitely not anywhere close to being dry. Okay. If you do have a root rot problem, usually if the roots are dying, if you're looking at the foliage, the growth tip is usually what starts to die first. If you think about the roots here, if the roots start to die right here, the ends die first and then the ends die here. So you'll see a decline there. Okay. If you see, if you know that there's a root rot issue because this is dying back, you'll notice that the tree in the pot starts moving more because all of these roots are weakened because they rot out. So you get less roots and you'll start to notice your tree moves a lot, okay? So if I notice that, what I'll do is I'll tie the tree down just to keep it stable so it doesn't keep rocking. Because new roots could try to grow and then they keep rocking and breaking. Okay. And a lot of times, if I'm worried about it being overwatered, I will tilt the tree. I'll put a little block here, just tilt it. And the water will drain out faster. And it'll break up this line right here where water wants to sit. And it'll just be right here. So that in turn will dry up the tree on top of you kind of holding back the water. Once you see foliage starting to grow normal again, it's gonna want water, so you can't keep, keep it dry. You gotta start giving it more water. Once you see this start to grow, you know this is growing again. Though, so again, from my experience, talking about this, every time I've gotten a weakened juniper from one of my clients or a client, the only thing I've ever done is I'll put food on the tree, I'll put it onto my watering schedule. If I see that the soil is really wet, I may hold back just a little bit. But after a couple of months, I'll see those foliage start to grow and I start watering it normally again. About 99% of the time, the tree will get healthier for me just because I put it on my watering schedule and I don't even try to keep it dry. So most of the time, trees are getting underwatered, and that's why they're having problems as opposed to being overwatered, especially if you use a soil medium like this. It's just hard to overwater the tree when the medium is that dry. Okay. So Peter, someone okay. asked from yeah. Phoenix, 
with 115 degrees, and Sacramento's been there as well recently. Um, how yeah. do you distinguish between root rot and sunburn or heat burn? Okay, so when you're looking at the foliage here, say there's your little tuft of green. Okay, if the tree dries out, the tips will start burning. They'll start dying. So this is where it gets brown, right there, brown. If it's sunburn, you'll see the browning out right here. It'll start from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Just like when you have a, uh, a leafy tree, okay, say here's a leaf. Sunburn, usually it'll be burned right here first and then it'll spread out. If the leaf starts to die here or shrivel up here, that's usually from heat, hot wind, uh, or drying out of the soil. That's where it'll start declining that way. If you see spots, sometimes that's more of a fungus, but it could be a sunburn spot too. Okay. Yeah, it's tricky when it's 115 degrees. If you get full, if you get water on the foliage, sometimes it can burn that spot just because that water sits there. I've seen that a little bit. But it has to be so hot for that to happen, though. I don't see it on a 90 degree day. It's always like 110, and then you might start seeing stuff like that. Okay. So root problems, terminal end or insect, things like that, or something happening with the root system. Browning out from the center out of the foliage is usually a sunburn. Okay. So uh, oh. back on watering. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if you had, if, would you pot a tree a half an inch below the pot rim in order to allow more water to sit in the pot to fall through? Oh, okay. Okay. So say here's your, your root spread. This is your root system right here. And that's the part you want to show. And say instead of repotting it right here in the pot where it's level to the top of the pot, you just sink the whole thing down a little bit and you don't add soil. So you essentially do this. Here's the pot, but your soil is still here. So now you have this space right here. Now, when you first repot, water goes through so easily that it's not going to fill this area anyways. But as the soil starts to uh, break down and compact, then this is a nice little spot where water can pool. And you know at least it's going to pool there and then slowly work its way down so that uh, you know that you're watering enough. That's usually what that's for. That helps in making sure, okay, the water didn't just hit the top and roll off the side. It actually sat there and you know it went through the pot. Usually what I do is when I first repot the tree, say here's the pot. I just put it slightly under. It's almost no gap there. Can you see that? Yeah. It's just barely under that lip. It's almost level. Because what happens fairly quickly is this topsoil will start to break down within a year or two years. And you'll notice that the soil will sink a little bit. And that gap will be more pronounced. Because if you do too big of a gap, when that soil settles, it might be a giant gap. And now maybe you're underutilizing the pot that you're using. You're using a smaller version of what it really is okay, by overdoing it. But that is a good way for allowing water to sit there and that can help water your tree or at least make sure you're watering your tree enough. Okay. okay. I don't know if okay. you wanna get into this. Somebody asked what fertilizers do you use? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I'll answer that and then we'll move on to back to branch structure because I want to show you guys some stuff. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the fertilizer I use right now is BioGold. Okay. It's a little pricey, but it works well. And that's just what I decided to use this year. Uh, and I'll probably use it the, the next coming years. So organic type fertilizer, BioGold, I think it's like 3.5, uh, 3.7, 3. Something like that. Okay. That's the N2. Okay, it's a Japanese fertilizer. It's pretty much composted chicken manure. 
Uh, if you're curious on how much bio gold I use, this is generally what I use. I use about five pellets uh, per uh, five by five inches of soil of surface area on the pot. So if your pot is a certain size, I calculate, say it's a uh, five inches here and 10. So that's 50 square inches. This is 25. So there's two pies of five pellets per month. Some people use 10 pellets every two months. But just like in any fertilizer, you can play around with it. Heavy, people who feed it heavier, they might go with what I'm using. But instead of five pellets, they put 10 every month or they put 15. Okay, it's up to you. It's pretty hard to over fertilize when the numbers are that low. So you, you, if you decide to use this fertilizer, just like any other fertilizer, you have to start with a baseline. You decide to go with a certain amount. You see how your tree grows, and then you decide, do I need to put more or less? So that's how inevitably anybody figures out how much fertilizer they use. They have to see how their tree responds to it, and is it good or bad? Did it grow enough, or did it not grow enough? So I'm going to draw this one last diagram, and then we'll see three pictures, and then I'll move on to a tree, and then we'll talk about what I see in kind of real world situations. So thinking about a pad, we talked about the overall pad shape. Front view, side view. Front. Side. Uh, I guess it is top view. I think that's the one there. Okay. If we're talking about the structure of the tree, here's a top view, here's a branch. And I'll just draw some branches that build that path. Okay. So when you look at this, you get your fan shape. I'm gonna grab another marker here. It's important to recognize two points. It's your starting point and your finishing point. Where's my division starting? And where do I expect the pad to be what I consider finished or the outline that I'm looking for for my tree? Okay, we'll start, finish. Where you want to finish will change where you start and where you start the branching will determine where you finish a lot of times. So for example, if this is the pad you're trying to create, if you start your division here and it's the same pad, that means it's gonna finish here and so forth. If you start here as your first division, let's say that one, I mean, it's gonna finish here. And you just wanna make sure that when you get to that finish, that's actually where you want it. Okay. So, same branch. If you have a new branch, and it's growing like this, which new branches do. And you have all this foliage. Some are longer, some are shorter. That's real big. Okay. And you're figuring out, well, how do I get this pad? If this is the pad you're looking for, and this is where your first division is, where's the first division here? It's right there. That's the one that's closest. It's a, you might argue that's a little far, but let's just say that is where we are. Okay. First division there. And it, it's a little tricky at first because you see all of this and you're thinking, well, can I use some of that and so forth? The problem is, is that if you try to use too much of this, say you make a cut right here and you try to use these branches, what happens is that when you cut here, this branch and this branch is now the leader. And these are number two, number three, number two, number three. It may look like you have a lot of foliage. The problem is that these guys are gonna keep going and they're gonna get stronger. 
and they'll start dividing. And now the leader is here. This is now number two. This is now number three. This is now number four. And these branches will start dying because they're not playing on the same level as these guys at the end. So you have to be careful. It's easy to do this. Wire these branches out and say, oh, look, my pad, I, this is great. Tree's looking really good. The problem is that it doesn't last. Okay. And that's instant bonsai right there. Okay. And this is a hard pill to swallow because ideally this is what you're really supposed to do. Is you gotta make the cut here. Sometimes you can fudge it and cut here because these branches are close and then you might be able to get them to all there, but we'll just talk a very basic version of this. You have to cut here, which means all this good stuff or what you think is good stuff is gone. And you're like, wow, my branch is kind of pathetic. I only have this and a little tough here, a little tough here, okay? The deal here is that if it's big enough, you can wire and wire. So you have a new lead and there's your little side. Because there's no back branch, you don't have to worry about anything getting weak. And your leader is here and here. You let those two grow, they do the same thing. They do their division, just like the original branch. At some point you cut and you have to cut to where you want it to divide. Try to cut to where you want it to divide. So you have a new leader taking off. Oops, right there, right there. And now you have your next division and then your next division and your next division. And over time, you let it grow, you cut it back, you get a division. You get a division and you can see how you're building this structure. And then you're just moving some of the branches around if they're not growing in the line that you're looking for. Fundamentally speaking, when you're developing trees, this is how you develop the structure of the tree. It's not a shortcut where you cut way far and try to use as many branches as you can. Usually what happens when you do that is that Instead of cutting here, you cut here. This is where the real division happens. At some point you lose these. That means if your starting point is here, your finish part is further than you might actually want. Because you're gonna start dividing, because it's getting, it's running and you're like, oh, dude, I gotta cut it. These guys start to drop off because these are so aggressive. Okay. And then when these are gone, and now we're four years later and you have this pad, you're like, oh no, this pad looks a little too leggy or it's too long. It's further than where I want it because you originally wanted to be here. And you're like, when this, where'd this come from? I didn't pick that, okay, because there was something there, but it didn't make it because they were second and third branches. You were not using hard cut terminal branches, ones with terminal ends. There's no back branch to die. You cut this one, it dies. Uh, uh, cut that one, it divides. There's your leader, there's your leader. Assuming they're at the same plane too. You can't cut this one too short and think it can grow with this guy. Okay, because you just made that a number two by making it too short. You can let it grow, you cut it again, it divides. Leader, 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 leader. Nothing in the back dies. Like this example. The tough thing is that this branch doesn't die immediately. It's like two years, three years, four years later, it finally dies. It doesn't quite make it. And then you don't want to find out after four years that your branch looks like this, because how do you get your division to start here again? You don't get to keep any of this. You have to cut it hard, try to get it to bud here, or you have to graft onto the section and then essentially rebuild what you wanted to do in the first place. So unfortunately, you, you don't get to keep any of those. You, you just lost all that time. 
And so one of the main things on today's program is making sure that we're cutting to where we need the tree to divide. And it's tough. You have all these good branches and your tree's maybe looking kind of good and you cut it to this and it looks like nothing. And you're like, oh, that's not fun. Okay. We got to look at it as if this is only one step. And then this is the next step. There's the next step. And you're like, wow, after I work on it, it's, it's starting to look good because you built all that. And then the next step. And you can get a lot of branches. And you see, you're not here, you're here. Okay. So make sure that event identify the start. Where do you want your division? Let's say it's right there. And based on, and over time, as you develop more and more pad structures, you'll get a basic idea of, I noticed that when I start here, I seem to finish here. And now you get a clear picture of where the finish is. And so if you want to finish it here, you're like, oh, I can't start. This branch is no good. I got to start it right here. And if you don't have anything there, you're not worried about making a pad. You might just have to cut the tree back to get a branch to start there. Just like that first example I was showing you. There's no point in wiring branches that are too far from the silhouette. You'll never go silhouette. If you start here and it's over here, what's the point of that? Maybe you have to start here. So now we're talking about where we might need to cut. To get things to start, we talked about the outer shape. Now, once you're successful in building something like this, okay, and this is just one pad in this whole tree, you start to figure out that this is actually the youngest version of a pad. And that older trees have more complex versions of this. So what, is, what does the tree do? Here's the trunk, it grows out, it starts looking for sunlight, it starts growing, dividing, dividing, it pushes itself away from each other to look for the light. At some point, as it keeps looking for the light, all these tips are looking for the light. Things that don't make it die off. Things that are too short, so it dies off. And it starts getting crowded at the end on the exterior. Usually what happens when branches jam up in together, jam up into each other, let's just say, let's just keep drawing this here. It just keeps dividing and growing. You see how things are gonna start jamming into each other which means branches, the tree's gonna start thinning branches out. Areas of the tree might die and the tree starts subdividing and finding its own spot. And now instead of one giant pad, it breaks apart into two smaller pads. Okay. So instead of a young pad, There. You'll see structures like this. And you can make it even more complex. This is just two. Okay, so it's a little bit older, but it's not the oldest. What the old structures look like. Things break apart. There's one pad, it breaks apart. Maybe there's another one. There's different planes. One comes out over there and so forth. Another one, and then one at the end. So everything breaks apart into these multiple pads, and here's a big heavy branch, second heavy, and so forth. Okay. Now, when you see complex structures like this, how things start subdividing into individual pads. What does it start to look like? It starts looking like a tree, uh -huh. which is the biggest structure, okay? 
And now you start to notice there's a repetition or a, a thing that you see in your tree where it's a, a repeat of the same pattern over and over, just in different sizes. So your tree is this. Your main branch is a little younger than your trunk, but it should have similar type of structure to make it look older. And then as you move up on the tree and the branches get younger, they'll be less complex to where maybe on the top you just have one path. Right. So, so when you're working ask, on your tree, and you're, yeah, okay. Um, they, uh, how do you develop pads in the vertical direction, such as what does a branch look like from the side? Uh, what does the pad look like from the side? Let's see here. Yeah, or the branch. That. Here's your tree. Yeah, like here's a side, here's your trunk. So the side view, the pad looks like that. Am I, is that the question? That's generally about the shape that is, is gonna be more or less something like that. And say here's another branch and there's another one there. Okay. Yeah, I think you okay. can. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's another one going to the back that you kind of see kind of something in the back. And that's say this grouping right here. But from the side view, it looks like that. Okay. okay. Now, when you're looking at the tree, straight on, and this is the canopy, it is going to be triangular in shape because if you go the opposite direction, bottom branch is going to die because it's going to die. So usually the lower branches tend to stick out further. Just like this right here, yeah, as far this, not as far, so forth. You can get some ins and outs like this. Can you see that? See how this one goes in a little bit, comes out in. Uh, mm. So those are things that you can do to make the tree look a little bit more real. Okay. Yeah. Another question is, oh, I need to admit somebody, bear with me. Um, at what age of the tree or what thickness of the main trunk do you start cutting back? Or do you or do you let a small like tree keep growing to thicken the main trunk before you start cutting back? Okay, so if we're talking about, well, it's, it's the same, it's just the size is different. You get a different color here. So if this was your trunk and there's a bird's eye view and you just have a little small branch, see that there? Okay. And the branch is skinny and this is what you want. That means you do have to grow this out until this branch is closer to the size that you want. Now with a conifer, it's a little tricky because if you let this grow out, you may kill off all the branches in here and then how do you develop these guys? So usually along the way, you grow this and as you have a few side branches that pop out, you let them grow and you don't cut them also. And you make sure that the branches above it are shading it out. And there will be a time where you may cut this, but it's not so hard that it dies. It divides a little bit, but it starts slowing down because you're letting this guy run. Okay. Closer to when you're finished here and then you get to make a big cut, now these guys are gonna do well. That's kind of more of the real world approach. It's not always just one to two. But it's important that if you know you wanna thicken this branch and you know you want a complex structure like this, all those extra branches that were here, when this branch was young, you know to get rid of them. And I'll, I'll show you some of that when we look at a tree. Which ones do you get rid of? How do I decide this is the one I want to grow in that one and not this one or this one? Okay. You do have to be able to picture this a little bit though. And think about, well, how big do I want this pad? How big? If I have another branch here, can I put a pad here and here? Or are they just gonna jam up into each other? Maybe I can't use that one, but I can use this one because that'll be here and this will be here and I can fit both of them. Now, this is just two dimensional flat. We have three dimensional trees. So you could have one here, but this pad is in a different plane. So you think about that also. If you're working on a deciduous tree, it's more straightforward because deciduous trees dug back very easily. Usually for those, I grow the branch or trunk 
as thick as I want it first, and then I cut it, and then I grow the side branch and the second part of the top. That's very straightforward. Once this branch is thick enough, I cut it, here's a new lead, say there's another side, or here's a side, whichever you decide to go with, and then you allow that to run. Okay. But with conifers, the problem is that if you get a bare branch like this and you finally cut it and it doesn't butt back here, then you're kind of stuck. You don't have anything to work with. On a trident maple, you could probably get it to butt. You still inevitably get the branch where you want. It's just the approach to get it is a little, and you have to deviate a little bit to cater to the growth habits of, say, a juniper. There are some deciduous trees that doesn't want to butt back to it. Hopefully I answered that question. I believe you did, yes. Okay, good. So I'll draw that pad again. Again, this is young. And if you want older, we want this to start subdividing. As you're working on your tree, try not to overthink it. Usually what I do, and I'll, sh I'll show you this in, in real world, is here's your branch. Things have been growing. Maybe you're trying to thicken some stuff. Okay. I look for scenarios like this. And remember, there's a bunch of green stuff. You've got to kind of see past all that stuff and look at the branch itself. And a lot of times, if I'm ready to make a pad, and so here's a little runner or something, I start thinking about, okay, well, how, do I, how am I trying to build this? Okay, I know I, I need a division there, at least to start. I see here and I see here. So that could be that. But sometimes I'll use another one to get this one and this, this one. And what I do is I cut this, I take this branch and I wire it to be my new leaf. I take this branch and I wire it, take this branch and I wire it. You see how this one's pointed and this one, I'm gonna draw it this way. It's a little short because they're in the back. I'd say there's a bunch of green on there. Now I can't leave this as a lead because this will just take off and these are going to slow down. So what I end up doing is most of the time I end up cutting here and I cut some of these and it kind of looks like a fan with three branches. And as they grow out of the shape or because I cut it, let's just say with this, and they have their foliage. Again, that nice, healthy, tight foliage we were talking about, not the leggy stuff. I find a spot to cut. And see how I get my division, 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 and then you build it. So that's a good way to start. Or you can go real bare bone. Here's your branch. And you don't try to keep that third. You just cut it right here. You wire that guy, let's say there, you wire that guy, say there. And then as they grow, you cut them, they divide, you wire something there, that's a new lead. And then you get that. This is a little bit of a shortcut. Sometimes that works out well if it's a small branch. You can't do it with really big branches, it looks kind of funny. But if it's a small branch and it's close right here to here, you can add that extra branch early as opposed to just going to twos like this, which means you get a little less up front. So you may need your this division here to be a little closer. So you have room to divide from two to four to eight. This one, you got three to six to nine. You see how that adds up faster. So that's a little trick you can use. But don't try to overdo it and use crazy branches to get more. Especially if this scenario, you try to use, let's see, that branch there. So you wire that, and you want to use this branch and this branch and this branch and this branch. 
you can cut this one about right there, which allows you to cut this one here, here. These are not anywhere close to the outside yet. You can not cut them, but there's still there's this gap right here. And what's going to happen is these guys will start growing because you cut them. And then these won't make it to the outside, so they can't play with that group. And then they decline. That's an overuse of branching. And you forgot where you actually want your division. And now it's actually here, which means your finish is here instead of here, if you had started here. Okay. Again, it's very tempting to just cut here and use more branches because you say the tree looks nice. You, uh, you can show it up to your friends. You, you feel like you're making progress. But five years later, when the pad is too far and you're thinking about what progress you made and you have to cut the whole thing off, it's better to just not get that early gratification and make that cut today than five years later find out you should have made that cut and then you just erased five years from your life. Okay, that's painful. When all it took was just you doing this today. And then when it grows, you do the same thing. Don't jump ahead, get the division close. And then it'll start building over time and you get a really looking pad with a lot of branches without it looking too leggy. All right. So let's just look at the uh, last three photos. And now we'll look at these trees together. So Jody, can you pull up those three photos? Okay, great. So the, the photo quality here is not that good because this is actually a picture of a photograph. I couldn't find the digital copy. This is a Sierra juniper in the mountains that's not too far from me. And this is a top view. When you look at it, you see how at the bottom of the pad, you can see a pad and then it's a little fan shape. And you can see above it is another pad and above it is another pad. Okay. So talking about pads and this kind of a fan type shape is not something that a group of people just made up. It's based off of how trees naturally grow. I mean. I would say that the pads we make are a little bit more uh, abstract in the sense that we make them look cleaner than how they grow in nature. But you can see the basis of where that structure comes from. Uh, you look at the next photo. So this is a side view of another grouping of branches. And you can see the heavy branches on the top right. As the, as the foliage is growing out and the weight of the branches is pulling everything down. And as you get towards the end, you'll see that the light branches, the newer branches, are starting to kind of grow up a little bit. Okay. So this is a good uh, kind of picture of uh, what a side, the side of a pad looks like. It, it, from the trunk, it goes out, drops down, and at the end, it starts to go up just a little bit. So you have kind of this soft curve. Now all the foliage that's pointing down will start to die off. Now in bonsai, we usually don't show that part because that's very like today. We show parts where all that foliage that's growing down has died and it's only the foliage that's growing up because it's the continuation of the, of the growth. And then as that foliage grows up and it grows longer, it gets heavy, it starts dropping down. Now foliage is pointing down, they start, they start dying off and the new foliage pointing up, they take over and the tree keeps expanding wider and wider. Okay, next photo. So I took this photo of a canopy, a Sierra Juniper canopy. It's, this was probably 40, 50 feet above my head. And it's a, it's a really good example. If you see how the heavy structure in the top and where they start to divide and where the next division is. And you can see the outlines of these multiple pads on the top of the tree and different levels of the tree and how major divisions in the branches start subdividing into their own little pad to make a giant pad. So you get say three little, if you look at the pad on the middle right, 
there's one kind of fan shape pad, big fan shape pad. But if you look at the branch structure and break it down, it's actually three small ones that are next to each other to make one big one. Again, on the on uh, on trees that are growing naturally, you see this kind of structure. Uh, whereas in bonsai, we we tidy it up a little bit, so the lines are much cleaner. But you can again see where we get this from. This is a really good picture to study because when you look at the branches and how they flow out, some things that you see is that, okay, there's some taper in the branch. That's nice to see, okay. Oldest to youngest. You'll notice all the movement in the branch are on the older branches and that all the young branches are straight other than they're flowing away from the center. Because young branches don't grow curves in them. They grow straight because they're young. They just want to grow straight to the light. You'll also see that when the branch divides, the angle of where they divide, it's about 30 degrees or so. It's never really 45. It's always a little tighter together. So remember, the branch wants to grow straight from the center of the tree out to the sun. As they start to divide and bump into each other, they start pushing away from each other. And slowly, as they get denser and denser, they keep pushing away. So that first division is always tight because there wasn't a lot of branches back then. They just push slightly pushed away from each other until they finally kept going and now they're a couple feet or 10 feet, 20 feet away from each other. But that initial fork tends to be very tight. So if you want your tree to have more naturalistic structures, you can follow this diagram or this picture here. And you can start use, you can start looking at those lines and duplicating those lines and incorporating that into your design to make it look a little bit more real or tree-like as opposed to kind of crazy structures that either trees don't grow um, or you're using kind of crazy structures because you're just trying to make a bad branch work, right? Okay, so that's the last picture. So now let's look at some trees. All right. I was asked if you're going to uh, touch on directional pruning at all. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, so for this branch right here, so this is the tree. It's a kishu. Let's see, there's a branch here and a branch there. There's another branch right here. Okay. I'm using this as an example of just like a big version of a small pad. So say this branch at the end, see this one, this is a branch that's slightly behind it. This would be one that I think about, okay, is this going to be the middle? Is this the middle of my pad? And if so, I might have to move it. This branch here, I would start moving and thinking, okay, is this going to be a side branch? And then I take this one, and can I bend it enough in at the base? So now I have a middle side and side, and that's kind of my three branches to start out the pad. Now, normally for this tree, I wouldn't do that because these branches are leggy. I mean, I'm, it's not good to use those. The tree is already too leggy. So normally I'll cut it and use this new growth in here. But again, this is just a big version of a, say a smaller structure that I would think about, okay, how do I make this work? Because we have other branches, like there's a branch right here. Is that something we can use? Or is it just in, in too much of an awkward position? It's actually growing on the bottom of this big branch here. So it might be too much to whip that around where you have branches like this one. Okay, if I use this, this, is that something I can incorporate in? Does it structurally make sense? And what about this one and so forth? And at some point you're gonna figure out, uh, well, I can use these, but I can't use these guys. And then you start getting rid of them as opposed to wiring them all to find out that you don't need them. Or you wire them on and you try to make a super pad 
and then they just jam into each other and then you can't effectively create a more ideal pad because it's too jammed up early on. So looking at the rest of this tree, we're really back to the first scenario. So look at these branches, they're all leggy, leggy. It's not even that time to make pads yet. I just have to get the tree to grow branches where I can use them. But you can see there's a lot of back buds on this drop branch here, all these guys here. So now it's a matter of looking at this foliage. How much of this can I cut off to help promote that back budding on the inside without stressing the tree out too much? Here's an example of foliage that's not the strongest. It's kind of wimpy. It's growing, but you see how it's kind of leggy because it's been in the dark underneath this canopy here. So I can't just cut everything to this one guy. That's too hard of a cut. Can I cut everything and just keep these guys? Eh, borderline. Might have to get one more. This guy's a little healthier. See, it's a little denser. And now think about cutting this off and keeping these guys temporarily until the buds in the back get stronger. Once this guy gets big enough, then I can cut this off and grow that guy out. And then once it's a little thicker, then I can cut where I need it to divide, just like in the diagrams I've been drawing. So sometimes when you get trees like this, it's, it's easy to get in there and be like, oh, wow, this is cool. I can wire this and wire that. When in reality, none of these branches are usable to you, unless you're planning on making a very wide licking tree. Don't jump ahead. Get the branches where you really want first. I know it kind of takes a little bit of time doing that, but your the end result is going to be so much better. Referencing back these trees right here, all these trees were built from grafts, just little tiny branches that came out from the trunk. They weren't branches that are already there. They weren't branches I tried to make work. They were just all small branches that I guided along the way. Grew them, cut them back, got them to divide where I wanted them to divide to inevitably build, to inevitably build the structure that you see here. This is the end result that you're looking for, that you're, that you're happy about. And you can maintain, if you do it well, you can maintain this shape for decades. If you try to fudge the structure a little bit and use too many branches that are not ideal or try to maneuver branches around to make it look like this, it doesn't tend to stay that shape for long. And you have to rework the tree more often than if you just develop ideal branch structures. How often do you propagate cuttings? Ah. Uh, anytime I cut trees, not so much these guys because the cuts that I make on it are so small. Uh, but on my donor trees, or if, say, I'm working on this guy, and say I feel that I'm ready to make, say, a cut here to get my first divisions going and have these guys take over, then I'll have this sphere, and then I'll usually take that as a, uh, I'll cut it into smaller pieces, and I'll propagate that. But also make sure, also make sure if you do start propagating junipers, that you label this tree, this foliage type. And say you just label this foliage A, so that when you propagate it, you know it came from this tree. So that if you're using that uh, foliage for grafting later onto another tree, you use the same foliage instead of mixing and matching foliage, because they do grow slightly different. So this whole branch system right here is coming off right there. These are grafts. got a certain right? amount of, yeah, th this whole thing is a graft and it blew out into all of it. So I've been growing it. Now, a while back, a year or two, maybe two years ago, this guy came out and it was smaller. It was just a little clump right here. And I thinned it out and I picked specific branches to let run. This is one. And here's another one. As opposed to, you know, the new foliage looks like this right here. And when, it, when it's small right there, it's like, which one do you let go? So I went through and cleaned this stuff up and just picked these two to let them run. Because I knew I had to grow these guys out big. Because this is going to fill in 
this entire area here. And I can't just use scrawny little branches. Okay. So this is currently, this branch is doing is I'm currently letting it run. Now along the way, see there's these little side branches, just like the drawing that I drew. And they have their own little tufts. And then the strongest part is right at the end. So you can see how these will stay alive, even though this is growing really strong. I haven't cut anything. What I did do early on is that when this fear was forming, I did eliminate some branches, just so that not every branch is trying to grow and only these that I kept are growing. Now, it doesn't mean I'm gonna keep all of these. Uh, that's not the case either. But I'm not keeping, I already took out about half of the, half of the branches growing off of this main stem so that these will stay healthy. Because I know at some point I'm gonna make a cut and something's gonna be my new leader. Now, if I'm looking for an older structure, here's a long line. Maybe this one I want to become one pad at some point. And say this one, I want to grow it and make it into a pad here. If I use this one to make a pad, it's pretty hard to grow this one and make a pad right next to it because this one's going to be here and then this one's going to try to be right next to it. I might want to space it, get rid of that and let this one grow. See how it's a little further down the line. And so I start thinking about that older structure that I drew on the board. Here's that one line down the middle. Is this going to break apart and build one, two pads? Is this one going to break away and build one, two? And what happens if I build this one here? make a pad here, what happens with these guys? Is it just gonna jam up into these? Does that mean I can't use this? Maybe I gotta use something further down the line because something on this side might be building a pad here. So that will get you to start moving things. Maybe I gotta move this over a little bit so that there's space and so forth. As I'm planning this, I always look at the front of the tree and I think about, okay, where's the top going to be? Where are the side branches are going to be? If I decide to make those pads where I think I want them, what is it going to look like from the front? What is it going to look like from the side? Do I need something lower because I want to see something here? Do I need to make something longer because I want to see something over here peeking out on this side of the bed? Just like... Here's my main branch. Do I just want to start cutting it and making a pad now when the branch is kind of skinny? Oh, no, that's a little in the back there. Yeah. Or do I need to let it grow out more so I get some girth in that branch? This branch right here is kind of a, just a little side note. It's a little funny because one of my clients grafted it years ago and he grafted Kishu right here which is the same here. But then he accidentally grafted a Toigawa here. <laughs> so there's two juniper foliages on there. <laughs> so, and that's what I'm saying. Well, Toigawa and Kishu, generally you can tell the difference, but sometimes when somebody's new, they can't quite tell the difference. And they go ahead and they start grafting and then, oh shoot, I, I forgot, I grafted the wrong foliage. It's kind of too bad. Maybe we could have used that, right? But at least we got this. So at some point I'm gonna cut this. I'm not sure I'm gonna use this branch because it's just this one tough and this long branch. Maybe I'll graft it or something. Or I might just gin in and just develop everything from the foliage you see there. Wow. One more example here. See a big division right there. Remember this branch came out as just like one of these little spears. It, it probably came out, there's a bunch of small branches, and then there's probably two spears here. I cleaned this stuff up, thinned some stuff out, and let the spears keep pushing. Because I plan on making this into its own thing, that into its own thing. I'm probably going to grow this guy out to be the main branch, and it's got to go much further and thicker. This one here, I'll grow it out, but I'll stop it sooner than this guy because I want to build pads up higher and not all the way down here like this guy. 
but right now they're still a little thin, so I got to still let them go. Now, some things that I do at this point, because it's kind of bushy, I'll show this example real quick. Say, for example, this is a branch I don't want to divide yet, and I want it to grow. So I want the terminal end to keep going. You see all the branches going off of it? So these are actually on the bottom, and those are on the top. What you can do to help this grow stronger and longer, faster, is I'll go through and I'll get rid of some foliage at the base there because I already want to use this branch. And I'll start getting rid of some of the foliage that's growing down. These guys might become side branches, so I don't want to pull them off. But I'll go through and I'll take their bottom go again. The ones on the top here, you can do the same for them. And what that essentially did by me thinning this branch is that whatever's left, these, this tip, this tip, this tip, they start to grow out faster which means you get your size a little faster or your length a little faster so that we can then go back, make a cut and start thinking about, okay, can I use these to make my pad? Say for example, I cut here, here's my center, here's the side, and there's the other side. This is a little long, so I'll probably have to cut its middle. And now the pad starts right here. And on the grand scheme of thing, for this size tree, that's a tiny little pad, but that's ideal. You want to make them look too small because as they grow and you cut, it's going to be a little bit bigger. It's going to be a little bit bigger every time you cut. Maybe we subdivide it. And then it fills this giant area. And it all started with just this one branch. You can make all sorts of stuff. So this is probably the easiest way to approach bonsai because you have this blank canvas. All you need is this one young branch and you can build everything off of that, as opposed to a number of older branches or uh, wild branches that are leggy and we have to try to figure out, well, how do you get them to work? Okay. Now, I'm not saying we can't use older branches. If they're usable, that's great. But a lot of times they could be so leggy that they, you can't create a design with them because they're just so long and they don't give you a division. And then you move to the next branch. Here's another branch. Okay, do I want that to grow longer to make its own pad here on the left? If so, I can accelerate that by cleaning stuff off the bottom. When they're young, you can pop them off pretty easily. And then I go to these individual tufts and I clean their base just a little bit. And now they look like an individual branch. I go to the next one. Clean out their base a little bit. Some stuff going down. I go to the next one. Once I get towards the end, there might be too many branches too close to each other. So say I have this one here, and then I've got another one next to it. But I'm thinking I might not have a lot of room for that. So I'll cut that. And now here's the lead. There's a side branch, and they both have plenty of space to grow without that third one right in the middle that could jam them up. So these are, these are the things I would do with this tree right now. Since I'm not cutting a lot of the branches back to work on the next division yet, I can accelerate it by thinning it out to get it to grow to the size I want. Then I can cut it back. And with this guy here. That's just a skinny branch. I need that one bigger. You see, it's just a clump. It's just starting to spike right there. And there's another one on this side. If I go through and clear things out, just like I did with this, this branch, these two spears will grow faster and I can start building my pad faster. If you just leave it clump, it'll stay clumped like this for a while. It will inevitably grow a spear. It just takes a little longer. 
because there's a bunch of stuff growing down, it's jamming into each other. But if I go in there and take away that stuff, I can accelerate it and then I get my trees designed soon. So those are things I would do this tree. Was there a question there? Uh, yes, someone, um, it was back to what we were talking about earlier. Can you touch on sunburn versus fungus? How do you distinguish okay. between the two and what is your fungus care? Okay, usually if you're looking at this foliage right here and you're looking at the tips, usually if the tree gets a fungus, a lot of times it's a tip light. And what happens is that the tip of the foliage, right at the tip, that part starts to yellow and turn brown and die. And all the individual little tips, that's the part that dies off first. So it's a, a receding of the exterior inwards. So that's when I usually think, oh no, it's fungus or there's some kind of root issue going on. Uh, if you wire a branch and you break it, yeah, usually the whole branch just starts turning brown, but sometimes you see the tips start to decline first and it'll recess it. Yeah. You see them. Sunburn, now I don't really have an example of a sunburn, but if you look at, say, this little cluster right here, if it's sunburned, you won't see any browning on the tips. You'll see it on the inside core, it'll start to turn yellow and it'll radiate outwards to the tip. And the tip can still be green and the core will be yellow or even brown slash black. And you're thinking, oh, the inside doesn't look too good, but at least I have the tip. What happens is it slowly works its way out because it's already dead right here. And this is just barely hanging on because it can absorb water through uh, just in the air. This can stay green for a while. Inevitably, that sunburn, if it's hard enough and it kills the stem here, it starts to die from the base out and then the whole thing dies. So if you see that happening on your trees, there's usually a couple of reasons. Either it really is just too much sun or the tree is in a lot of sun, but it's also drying out at the same time. So if your tree is hydrated, it doesn't sunburn as easily if it's hot outside. If it's hot outside and you water it enough, a lot of times you won't get that sunburn. It's a combination of either too much sun or there's a lot of sun and not enough water is really what gets you on the sunburn side. But again, for me, where it's 100 degrees, 110, like in Sacramento, uh, usually I put these down to 30% shade. Uh, California junipers, I can keep them in full sun, but you can tell they're having a hard time, uh, especially because they're in bonsai pots. So when I started developing Californias or native uh, junipers, I'll generally put them under 30%. It seems to just kind of take the edge off of the foliage, uh, off of the tree in general. I was uh, measuring the soil temperature the other day uh, with my apprentice, Eli, and we found that somewhat consistently uh, that in the full sun, when I measured the temperature of the soil kind of close to the edge of the pot, there was a certain temperature and everything under 30% was about 10 degrees cooler. And everything under 50% was about five more degrees cooler. So that shade cloth, it doesn't just help protect the foliage, it can help protect the soil from getting so hot too. So that's kind of like a little side bonus there. And that can go a long ways in why your tree might get sunburned or damaged. And it has nothing to do with the sun on the foliage and everything to do with the pot just getting so hot. Yeah. Usually smaller pots get hotter faster. Speaking of heat, somebody asked if uh -huh. you fertilize in the hot summer. Do I fertilize in the hot summer? Uh, I do. Uh, generally, we know that there is a slowdown in the tree in the summer, especially when it gets really hot or if the tree is Sometimes if the conditions for the tree isn't as ideal, it'll start to stop growing also. Say it's not getting quite enough water on time. Or generally it's so hot that the trees just start to slow down. They're not growing like spring anymore.
Uh, so for me, part of having the shade cloth is that because the tree still continues to grow in the summer, even though it's hot, I still fertilize. Generally speaking, it's, if you're using organic fertilizer, it's pretty hard to over fertilize any tree at any time of year. The only time I've seen a problem with uh, over fertilizing a tree is when somebody was using um, an Osmocote type product, which is a temperature release uh, chemical fertilizer. They put a bunch on the tree, they watered it in, I mean, an excessive amount, more than I would ever put on the tree. Like the whole top soil was almost covered. And the next day it got really hot. So the fertilizer just released, uh, uh, so the pellets just released a lot of chemical nitrogen into the soil. That's about the only time I've seen trees burn. I've never seen a tree burn when somebody puts, say, composted chicken manure on top of the tree. And I've, I've seen people put mountains of that stuff. It's just not strong enough to really burn the tree. Uh, now, if your tree is healthy, it's going to take it. If your tree is a little sick, then it's going to take it worse. You know, so if you have a sick tree and you put a lot of fer uh, organic fertilizer, maybe you'll get something bad happening. But if the tree is growing normal, it's almost never a problem. Uh, just like this, the whole adage of, well, when I repot a tree, should I start fertilizing? And a lot of times people say, no, don't fertilize because there's no roots and the, you can burn the roots and all that stuff. In my experience, I have never seen that happen. And there's been a lot of times where I'll repot a tree, I'll put fertilizer on there and the tree just starts growing right away with no, no evidence of any kind of burning. So I wouldn't be too afraid about using the fertilizer. You'd have to use just a gross amount to get any kind of uh, bad reaction from your tree. And then once you get into finer stuff with your trees, then you might say, well, I put too much and the tree grew too fast and that was the problem. It's not that it burned, it's just it grew too fast and you didn't want all that growth. And that becomes kind of a problem. Excellent. Okay. So I have this tree here. Kind of a funky tree. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that were at the 2018 convention in Sacramento, Suthan actually worked on this tree. It's a, it was a California juniper. I got it at the auction and I took it home. And, uh, and a, about a year later, I grafted a Toyagawa onto it. So it's kind of rare to see kind of a blade in California junipers. So it's pretty cool. I brought this tree in to show you this example here. So this is a branch that I grafted. You can see right there. And I've been growing it out. So it's a certain thickness. Now, based on the size of this branch to what the graph looks like now, this branch is actually ready to be worked on. So at some point when this was growing, I did do the thin out and I selected a few branches to grow like that one, this one, and then a few more down the line. It's kind of spaced apart. Now I'm thinking about, okay, what's the next step? My branch is thick enough. I want to start moving into divisions and making paths. Now let's just say, for example, I have this branch and this branch. This guy is one division, and this guy is another division. Do I want to grow these two branches out and have them take over and grow close to each other and then move away to potentially build two pads? They don't have to be two pads right next to each other like this. You can have one higher and lower from one another, which allows you to scoot them a little closer together has a real good kind of overlap feel. So you don't have to do this. That requires a certain amount of space. Get one a little higher or one a little lower 
and you can bring them in and they don't take as much space. So now's the time where I start thinking about is do I want to make that into its own pad? Do I want this into its own pad? What else do I got down here? Is that going to be its own? And then at some point you're looking at these guys and you're like, well, how many pads do I want? Uh, do I really want one, two, three, four, five, six? As we get down the line. That's too much. That might be too much for this design. Okay. I'm thinking on this tree, I want to show off the dead wood, really keep a real small head and just keep the pads very basic and light. Maybe one, two, one, two, something like that. Nothing, not a huge canopy. So even though it looks like I have all this growth right here, is it really just comes down to here's my first division and I'm thinking I'm gonna turn that into one and one, and then we cut this. Then I put wire, I move this to where I want it, and I move that to where I want. It. And I get these guys down and growing. And once they're thick enough and they grow not longer, I look at what branches I have here and where's my next cut to then work on the next division to start building that pad, just like in the diagram I drew. If you wanted something just like one pad, you can wire these two together and start building one pad together. And we don't have to grow them kind of their own separate ways. If I wanted something even bigger, can I pull this guy in, make that my center, make this a side, and make this a side? and have the start of my pad there. It's a bit big for this size tree. But if everything was smaller, I could maybe do that. But in this case, it's probably going to be these two. Again, all this foliage right here, you're thinking, well, you know, we can probably wire a lot of stuff, make it look kind of full, it would be great. But I'm not thinking of today. I'm thinking of what is it going to look like in the future if I go for this and this as two pads and I make this cut today? The tree's not going to look like much. It essentially just went from one to two. And this goes away. I just got to think of the future. Once this turns into two and this turns into two, it'll start to look like something. And then their twos turn into fours. And before you know it, you're going to have a pad and you're you're more worried about, oh no, I got to work on it again because there's so much foliage that's growing and I got to keep, and there's all these little tiny branches I have to deal with. And you long for the days of, oh, well, that was easy. All I had to do was just cut here and wire these two. That's like really easy. Instead of trying to keep all of this and trying to make some giant pad of like, here's the middle and here's the side and here's the other side and here's the fill on the top and it looks good right now. But before you know it, it's too late for this size tree because the tree is not very big. Yeah. Somebody asked, if, will you finish developing the pads before you move it into a show pot? Uh, for this tree, it's been in this pot for, I believe about three years. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say it's due for a repot. I do like to do some of this development while the tree is in an oversized pot because I know that the tree is nice and healthy. It's insulated. I don't have to worry about underwatering it. But as I start developing the pads and I need the tree to slow down and I can't afford to have it run like this anymore, then I'll start thinking about downsizing the pot. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a show pot uh, because it might want to fall over a lot because it's pretty top heavy or side heavy. Uh, but I might reduce it down into a smaller pot. And then the show pot will either be a pot it can actually grow in, or it might be a pot that it normally can't grow in well because it's too small. I would like. I think I can probably find a pot where I can grow the tree in. Uh, that is also a show pot because I will need this guy to stay real small and compact in the future. Uh, so having in a small pot will really help in that. And my watering system is, is very robust because uh, I, I, I tend to water things on time and there's no issues with things drying out. So I can kind of afford that, that smaller pot. Good question. Any uh, other questions? One, one question was, have you written a book yet? 
<laughs> uh, I have not written a book, uh, though I know that uh, Jonas is um, Jonas Dupree is writing his second book on bonsai care, and uh, he's he asked a number of professionals to add like a, a page or two vignette to add to kind of teaching people how to take care of their bonsai. Uh, and I'll be a part of that where I talk about, you know, structural development, kind of step one, step two, step three, where do you start, what do you focus on, focusing on stuff like this branch first instead of this branch first, which is far away. It's going to get cut anyways. So so there, that is coming. So that's going to work. But I, I've not thought about writing a book or anything. <laughs> Thank you for asking, though. Another question was, do you have a favorite type of tree to work on? If so, why is it your favorite? You know, that's a, I, I get asked that question a lot. And I think I found the perfect answer to that because inevitably we all get asked that question. And, uh, and I would say what I found to be true is that I really like working on a tree that is good. So if it's a tree that's high quality, it has something very interesting about it, it almost doesn't matter what type of tree it is because the tree is so nice. It's just fun working on those trees. You know that they're going to be great in the future. You know, just love looking at it. Uh, so I wouldn't say I have a particularly favorite species uh, because every time I work on a juniper and if the juniper is good, I just feel so good about it. Or if I'm working on a maple and the maple trunk line is really good and the structure is really good i just feel great about working on it so they they kind of become my favorite every time i work on it i i would say i do lean towards deciduous trees a little bit more because not as many people do those so i kind of want to get those up and running whereas a lot of people do work on junipers but it's it's not like i dislike junipers i i've been grafting them like crazy and i I'm looking forward to developing all the structure and, and getting more refined junipers out there. Uh, and we'll probably just take a couple more questions. I may have to wind up. You, this has been wonderful. Okay. One oh. of the questions was, okay. do you like to use native foliage like frost, frustrata? frustrata? Oh, do I like to use like frustrata foliage? Well, it says okay, native so, foliage like prostrata, I guess. Oh, okay, okay, native foliage. Uh, so I, I get that question a lot too because I talk about grafting often. So the tough thing about native foliage is this. Most of our native foliage is big. So let's just say Kishu, I'll just draw a bigger version of it. It can grow like this and it's very tight. And so there's there's your branch. Whereas some of our native foliage, like Pestrata, it's a bit bigger. It's not super huge, but it's definitely bigger. And anytime something grows big and you're trying to shrink it down, it's always harder. If you have something growing small and you shrink it down, that's much easier than if it's big. Because you can see you're limited at where you can cut because the foliage is further apart. And the same amount of growth same amount of division, you see how this one grew up farther and this one grew this much. So aside from working on say Pistrata, where it, if you cut it too hard, they like to go juvenile and the foliage turns into needle foliage, which is a bit of a problem because it doesn't look that good, is that now you're dealing with foliage that you have to be careful on how much you cut the gaps or the inner nodes between the branches are longer, which means over time, as this tree, this guy gets bigger, this one gets bigger faster. And because this guy right here, you can grow real small and tight, you can keep very little. And so when you're down the road, when you're working with trees that have larger foliage, the tree actually reaches the finish line faster. And now you're kind of worried that the tree is getting too late. When you use trees that have foliage that's very short or the inner nodes are very short, by the time you get to this finish line, it could be decades sometimes. And now you get to enjoy your tree and how it looks for say 20 years. Whereas this one potentially is five, maybe it's a little bit more, maybe it's a little less because the tree just grows big foliage. 
And you'd, I, you'd like to think that, well, we can just cut it back, right? Again, the space sometimes is too wide. So you can cut here or here. On juniper foliage that's closer, you see how you can cut, I can make two cuts and it's still about this length. Now I'm not discouraging you from using Pastrata or any of our natural foliage. It's just thinking about how much time you have to spend developing that foliage. You just gotta go in knowing that you're gonna reach the finish sooner Usually our native foliage, uh, like California Sierras, if you cut them a little too hard, they go juvenile, where tissue, you can cut it a little bit hard and they will not go juvenile. You just know that with, our, uh, with natural foliage, the bigger foliage, you just reach your size sooner with less ramification. And now you have to backtrack and rebuild it more often. Whereas with smaller foliage, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating, so let's just say it's double. That just means you get to enjoy the shape you created with twice as long as this. So it's just a little bit more work to maintain this. Okay. So you just gotta go in knowing that. One of the downsides uh, that I talked about earlier is that you have to be careful how much you cut if they go juvenile. And that in itself forces you to keep more, which means the tree gets to the finish line faster because you can't cut where you really want. You can only cut here because if you cut here, the foliage goes juvenile or it dies off, it gets too weak. And on California, as any of you that have California, if the foliage gets weak or Sierra's, any of your native collected stuff, they start to hang. Kishu will do the same too, but you have to really, it, it doesn't happen as easy as on the California through pruning. And now you have to replace that foliage because now it hangs. And you're like, when is this going to happen? And then you find out, well, I have to cut here and then here. And then you're at the finish line. So for me, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that the natural foliage is bad. It's not like I hate it or anything like that. The problem is that I just can't restyle the trees so many times. It's, it's not as, I'm not interested in that. And I actually like it when trees are, you know, real full looking. I can maintain that shape. I don't have to worry about restyling it over and over. You can maintain those pads for a long time because the foliage is real tight. As long as you can grow it healthy. Excellent. Excellent. I, I, yeah, I will, I will say uh, one last thing about that is that if you do decide to use trees that have larger foliage, because there's, the junipers aren't the only tree that has that, you can get something like a ponderosa pine that can have four or five inch needles. Okay. The candle can grow and the needles can be this long. And there are ways to shorten it, but it's a bit of a process to shorten it. The only time I might be okay at using that is if the tree is really big, where this doesn't look disproportionate to the trunk size. But if the trunk is only this big and the branch grows and the foliage is this long, you see how it's so disproportionate. You're, you're kind of like, what am I trying to do here? Other than, oh, I just like ponderosa, so I just kept that foliage, which is okay. But, and that's the reason. But trying to get that to be proportionate when your tree is this small is very difficult. But if the trunk is like this wide, now it's small. So if the tree is really big, I'll tend to keep the original foliage. But if the tree is a little too small, I try to use foliage that's a little bit more proportional. So that's one of the other reasons why I, I graph them too. Makes sense. Uh we had one, maybe one or one last question. Uh, okay. What do you do when you get juvenile needle growth? Okay, so when you get juvenile needle growth, say here's your branch and it's mature. It's the soft stuff, which we all kind of like. Okay. And you decide to cut it real hard or it just gets cut too hard. You cut it. And so you cut that tip too the new growth comes out and it grows spiky. So we call that juvenile foliage, immature foliage. Okay. 
And you're like, oh no, I must have overstressed the tree because I didn't intend to do that. So how do we make that better? Well, the good part is that if the tree is at least growing the spiky foliage, you know that it's trying to recover. So it didn't just die off. So that's good news. If you leave this alone and you allow it to continue to grow, as the tree gets healthier, it'll start reverting back to normal, healthy, mature foliage. And it won't be the spiky stuff. Now, the problem is that spiky stuff here doesn't go away. The new stuff is good. Say M for mature. I'll just say J for juvenile. But at some point, these needles will become old and they will dry up and they will fall off and you're left with a brown branch. And you can just work with your mature foliage here. You just gotta make sure you allow this to grow until it grows mature foliage. If it just barely grows and you cut it again, it will most likely come out juvenile again. And then now you're stuck with needle foliage. And there are some junipers out there, native junipers, that anytime you cut it, even a little bit, it wants to go juvenile. I think there are certain, I can't remember the name of the juniper, but there's a handful of them. You just barely try to cut it, it wants to go juvenile. It will become mature again, but it automatically goes juvenile first and then grows mature. One of the tough things about immature foliage when it grows here is that it tends not to divide. So even though you get this good growth here and these needles fall off, did you just grow a leggy branch? Mm. which is a big problem when you get juvenile foliage because it'll give you that a lot. And then you're like, well, I can have healthy foliage here, but I need my division here too late. Yeah, lot. And you see the dangers of growing juvenile foliage is because it might mess up how you can get your divisions where you want. So it's not good to kind of play the juvenile game. You definitely don't want to stay away from that. It's, it's hard to try to develop something if your tree is going juvenile all the time. Uh, San Jose junipers have both foliage, so you can work on them. Uh, and you just know that you have both. Prostrata is normally mature foliage. And if you cut it just a little too hard, it does want to go juvenile easy, easier. Uh, and then there are some trees like procumbens that normally needle, and you just cut it, and it's just always needle. And you don't have to worry about juvenile foliage because it's already juvenile foliage or immature foliage. Excellent. Any other questions? We don't. And I, I oh, think okay. maybe it's time to wrap it up. Wrap it up. <laughs> okay. you have, uh, any final words of wisdom? This has been fabulous. Uh, final words of wisdom is... Okay, so when you're working on your trees, just make sure that, okay, take it step by step, right? You, you have all this flexibility, you know, focus on, focus on growing your tree well. And think about, okay, how you're feeding it and all that stuff so that you can get the tree growing nice and healthy. So it's actually easy to work on uh, instead of working on sick foliage and things like that. When we get into developing branches, try not to rush where you're at on the branch. Focus on making the cuts where you need them to be and think about the future. I want this pad here. Where do I got to start that division? It's probably back there somewhere. And how do I slowly build things out, build things out? And in no time, I mean, it happens faster than you think. You get something like this and you're just super happy about it. Okay. So think of the future. Try not to get too, too stuck with instant bonsai or I want it to look good today. It happens really quick. Just let it take its time. And the interesting thing about instant bonsai is that in Japan, for example, there is like no such thing as that generally. Uh, when they develop the structure, they're just kind of like, yeah, it's straightforward. You work with one, you get two, you get four, and you get eight, and then you build something, just like building anything. There's, there's, there isn't this rush in like, well, let's make all these branches look good today. That, seems to be kind of a, a thing we tend to do more here. It's not like it's not like they don't do it in Japan. They do it sometimes, but it's less that. And so they get a lot more refined trees that last a long time. You'll see an old juniper that's a bonsai for decades and it looks kind of the same. 
It's not like it got super leggy or got too beat up. Uh, and they had to reach they had to cut everything off and regrow things. They keep things very stable and they can keep the shape for a long time. And I, I don't know about you guys, but when I spend all this time trying to create a juniper like this, I don't want to spend all that time again just to do it all over again. I want to enjoy this picture for a long time before it starts getting too wide. So just think about the techniques you're using and make sure you're not accidentally making the tree grow faster or bigger on you so that you can't enjoy the final shape for long and it grows past that. And I see a lot of that uh, happening to, to people in the hobby. Okay, I think that's about it. <laughs> sure, this was fabulous. People are writing thank you and excellent. Oh, good, good, thank you. you learned a lot, lots of information. Um, really. Yeah, yeah. I, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about this more and I'll have handouts at the, at the GSPF rendezvous, actual steps one, two, three, uh, and we'll talk more core structural things. And we'll be in person, of course. And uh, a lot of good information. I'll bring examples, uh, as always. And uh, yeah, I hope I, I'll see a lot of you guys there. I hope and so. anybody that's not making it, I'm glad you joined this and uh, and, uh, and stuck it to the end. October twenty first at from nine to ten thirty. So um, that's right. That's that's what my seminar is. Yeah. So yeah, excellent. I'll be a vendor there too. So, so yeah. So yeah, come and see me. We can chat. Say hi. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Oh, I should turn it off. All right. Thank you. you, Thank you everybody. Excellent. Have a good night.